Hey Internets, so this is a follow-up to my Holodomor denial video I put out a little while ago. In this video, I'm going to be explaining why you should take Apple Bomb's work more seriously than Tauger's when it comes to whether or not the Holodomor, or Stalin's massacre of the Ukrainian people in the early 1930s via a man-made famine, was in fact a genocide or not. Now, what's really interesting about this is I was planning on this specific video before I even finished my Holodomor video, because the use of the work Red Famine, which Apple Bomb wrote, tends to cause a lot of tanky butter, I guess you could say. So I figured this would be the big thing behind any response I would potentially get. What I did not expect is for someone, specifically Bad Panda, to come out swinging with the Ma Tauger defense almost immediately. And because of this, I've decided to make this a longer than usual gamer rant and both go with what my original video idea was, as well as respond to some of the things Bad Panda said. And I'll just use chapters to divide the two, although I should stress that I strongly recommend watching the first part of this video about Apple Bomb and Tauger before watching the second half with my response to him, or some of the things he said, because honestly, a lot of them are refuted when you understand why you shouldn't really take Tauger seriously, because the central point behind Bad Panda's argument is directly refuted by the first part. As I was already aware of this review from Tauger on Applebaum's work before I published my Hello to More video, it was one of the things I found when I was doing my research for it. It's very much not a very good review at all, and it's important that I go over it and explain why it's not a good review, because doing so doesn't just refute Bad Panda's points, it refutes pretty much all tankies who use this as a way of dismissing Red Famine. Oh, and yes, I know it's pronounced empanada, I just don't care. Bad Panda is more fun to say. Deal with it. Anyways, starting with the original follow-up video I had planned in response to this review. So, Anne Applebaum and Mark Tauger. Who are these people, and why should anyone interested in the history of the Holodomor care? Well, Anne Applebaum is a historian and journalist who graduated with a degree in history and literature from Yale, studying Soviet history under Wolfgang Leonard, who was a well-known historian and lecturer himself. She has written several books and articles on European and Soviet history, but the one we care about most for the purpose of this video is of course Red Famine, which documents in heavy detail why the Holodomor was indeed a genocide, and is one of the books I used for a reference for my own video on the Holodomor, of course. While Mark Tauger is a historian and associate professor for West Virginia University, he's written books on agriculture and several papers arguing that the Holodomor is mostly explained by natural disasters, but he does at least admit that Stalin's collectivization policies did, again at the very least, make it worse. But he also denies that the Holodomor could be classified as a genocide, however, emphasis needs to be stressed that he does not believe that Stalin did nothing wrong. Occasionally some Stalinist tankies will try to cite his work and claim otherwise, however, that's not a position that Talgar actually holds. Now, of course, I read some of Tauger's work and found it relatively unimpressive. The main problem with his central claim is that it just runs into a basic wall of reasoning. If there were natural causes to the famine, why did those problems magically stop at the Ukrainian border? You would expect Poland and certain parts of Romania, which were part of the borders at that time, to also suffer from any famine caused by natural problems. At the very least, it happened near the edges of said borders due to similar climate. Instead, no such thing occurred, which is very odd considering that most of the geography between the two countries doesn't include any real natural barriers, it's mostly just flat farmland. So where is the Polish super famine in the 30s? I tried to see if Tauger has an answer to this and couldn't really find anything. But more importantly is this negative review Tauger did of Applebaum's work on the Red Famine again. Pretty easy review to find, as Reddit communists generally link to it whenever Red Famine is mentioned. Again, in fact, I kinda chuckled when seeing that it's the main source that Bad Panda used in his response to my video, because again, I've seen this review before. So let's take a look and see what it says, and you'll come to understand why I didn't consider it a threat to Red Famine's credibility. Now, Tauger's review starts out fair enough. He acknowledges Applebaum as a journalist and a historian, and acknowledges some of her work, but then we immediately run into our first little red flag, where he says that it overall, however, retells the nationalist story of the famine found in earlier publications, alluding to Ukrainian nationalism. This is a red flag because the idea that the Holodomor is Ukrainian Nutsi propaganda is generally a well-known Russian agitprop talking point. And I am not the first person to notice this problem with Tauger. He's somewhat known for doing this from other academics, and that he kind of uncritically regurgitates talking points from the Russian government that have long been discredited. This was also something I did an entire section of in my main video about the Holodomor, which Bad Panda did not respond to. Mo Ukrainian nationalism is just nonsensical propaganda. There's absolutely no good evidence for it whatsoever. At least in terms of Ukrainian nationalists somehow fabricating evidence of the Holodomor in any meaningful way that would change the conversation. Key point there, in a way that would change the conversation, because that's kind of the problem with this review. Moving on, things get a lot worse. Tauger makes several statements that the book relies on published sources that people might misunderstand her use of the Soviet archives to imply that she was the one who did all the research, and she talks about cherry picking and that she allegedly falsely claimed that Tauger's work wasn't based on archival resources. So sad. Now all of these claims have basically the same problem in common. 
Tauger's arguments are a textbook example of pedantry. None of these claims actually refute the central point behind what Applebaum was saying. They are simply nitpicks that add nothing to the conversation. So she used some published sources that are publicly available. So what? Does that refute them? No. So because she didn't reinvent the wheel, that means she is wrong? Uh, no. That's completely irrelevant and ridiculous to even point out. And that there's a possibility that someone could make a mistake of thinking Applebaum did all the heavy lifting and going through the Soviet archives that opened up after the fall of the Soviet Union? Again, totally irrelevant and changes nothing. As for the cherry picking, this is what Applebaum actually wrote. She isn't even really blaming a specific side here, claiming that both sides of this debate she's even talking about make the same problem and claims that all scholars involved were cherry picking, which if you're familiar with with academia, you know that this is entirely true. They do this all the time. But even if it wasn't true, she's making a neutral statement. So what does it even matter? What does it even change? What point is Tauger refuting here? And the last part is especially outrageous. Applebaum isn't so much falsely claiming that Tauger isn't using archival data, but rather is merely questioning his interpretation of that data, which for reasons I stated earlier about the famine is entirely correct. Tauger's arguments make very little sense when examined rationally. So Tauger completely missed the point of what Applebaum was saying. She's She's not lying, she's just disagreeing with them. Tauger is missing the point here. He is equating disagreeing with how he is viewing this evidence for claiming that he never looked at the archives at all or didn't base his ideas on the archives. These are absolutely not the same thing. And this unfortunately seems to be a fairly common again with Tauger. There are other academics who have run into the same issue where Tauger seems to misunderstand arguments and makes irrelevant nitpicks that may or may not be true that ultimately do not prove anything to the contrary. Basically, he makes stereotypical pedantic arguments where he seems to think that if he pokes at random subjective inconsistencies or other random issues that add nothing to the conversation, then this will somehow magically prove that his own interpretation of Soviet history is the correct one. Despite the fact that his reasoning on this is generally rejected outside of being praised by Reddit commies, which again is no surprise because his reasoning makes no sense. Next up, Talgor argues against the definition of Holodomor. Again, the same problem. The specifics of how Holodomor came to be used by Ukrainians to describe death by starvation ultimately do not matter. Even if Talgor is correct here, which he arguably is not as these specifics have been hotly debated, all Applebaum is really doing here is providing an oversimplification. And whether or not it's the academic definition or that her analysis of how it came to be is accurate, it certainly matches how the word Holodomor is used today, which means that once again, Talger has provided us with an argument that may or not be technically true, but it's utterly pointless, proves nothing, and doesn't add to the conversation again. Especially since language is, as progs often love to say, just a social construct. They are combinations of sounds used to convey meaning, which changes per population and cultural groups and changes over time. Whether Applebaum is correct on the exact specifics of how the word Holodomor got dissected and how it led to it, says nothing on how the word is used by Ukrainians today. So once again, Tauger has provided us with pedantry. It doesn't matter at all if he is right here. And this is how the nitpicking or logic chopping as it's sometimes called fallacy works. Note how Tauger states this in the same paragraph as talking about whether the book is coherent and comprehensive or not. He really does seem to think that if he pokes enough holes in random places, it will eventually prove his point. But that's just not how this works. And what's really bad is the next paragraph. Tauger writes, Applebaum portrays Ukrainians as unique and different from Russians in line with Ukrainian nationalist arguments. This again is pure Russian propaganda. Whining about mo Ukrainian nationalism mirrors the same debunked points from Douglas Toddle's work, Fraud, Famine, and Fascism, which was proven to have ties to the Soviet government in its creation. The only people I ever see taking this claptrap seriously are, again, Reddit commies. And as for the number of peasants, Applebaum is clearly talking about peasants as a class, as seen as a nationalist threat from Stalin against the Russian Republic. So again, Tauger is missing the point. It doesn't prove anything about how Stalin viewed the situation, which is the point that Applebaum was making. And I'm sorry if me pointing out Tauger's pedantry is getting repetitive here, but that's practically the main problem with this entire review. It is entirely pedantic. Nothing in here comprehensively refutes the central arguments made in Red Famine. Moving on to the next paragraph, he complains about Applebaum overemphasizing negative aspects of Russian-Ukrainian relations. Now, um, in Tauger's defense, I do need to quickly point out here that this was written after the current Russian invasion of Ukraine, so I know Tauger's take here sounds a lot more yikes and bad than it actually is, and of course, it's in reference to a different time, so it doesn't even matter, but yeah, even considering that, it's still a pretty bad analysis. Just because Ukrainian books were not immediately banned doesn't really soften the blow of the fact that they eventually were. 
Book banning is generally pretty serious, so if anything, Tauger is the one downplaying here. Which of course he is, because he's downplaying the Soviet invasion of Ukraine that happened in just in 1919. That was not a small issue. It involved tens of thousands of troops in an attempted aggressive takeover. But in all honesty, whether or not it's an overemphasis is just kind of a matter of opinion, so as silly as what Tauger is saying here is, I'll just move on and skip to the more juicy bits of this review, such as this gem in the very next paragraph. And I'll just read this part out word for word. Applebaum describes food shortages in Soviet cities in 1928, but then writes that in Ukraine, police discovered many tons of grain that had been kept back because peasants had, quite rationally, been waiting for prices to rise. By calling peasants actions rational, Applebaum seems to endorse their withholding of food for high prices. So this particular statement right here highlights one of the main problems with Tauger and the difference he has with Applebaum. Applebaum, after graduating from Yale, went to study at the London School of Economics for her master's. So she understands something about how incentives work. While Tauger, well write stuff like this. Yes, actually, it was rational for those peasants to hoard grain, because the Soviet policies were in practice making it harder to trade without a rising suspect. If any leftists who are listening to this are having trouble understanding why Applebaum is right about how trade disincentivization causes this problem, just look at the effects of drug prohibition on the price of drugs. It goes up. It goes up a lot. Because of course, state aggression that reduces trade is a means of artificially throwing the supply and demand out of whack. Any reasonable person could tell that the family was going to continue due to the horrifically stupid policies the Soviets had put in place. And since people are individuals and not collectives, the incentive is thus to hoard grain, both for potentially making a massive profit when it does become safe to trade, and for the purpose of keeping yourself and your own family alive during these hard times. Now, you may not like the fact that humans tend to behave selfishly like this, but it's just how humans are, and a system for human society needs to be based on humans. People will do what is in their best personal interest to achieving their intended goal. That is a rationalist way of looking at how human action works. This reveals the fatal flaw in Mark Tauger's reasoning. The man, unfortunately, does not seem to understand basic economics. This problem with how Tauger looks at things is further proven by his later confusion. He writes, Applebaum claims that the government's procurements to alleviate that shortage comprehensively destroyed the peasants' incentives to produce more grain. Yet later she writes that the 1930 harvest was much larger than the 1929 harvest. How could that have happened if peasants' incentives were comprehensively destroyed? Wow, this is a mystery. Gonna have to put my thinking cap on for this one. Yeah, okay, this is one of the worst arguments I've ever seen coming from someone with a PhD. Incentives are not a freaking binary. They are a scale. There is a massive valley between being 100% disincentivized to do something and 100% incentivized to do something. People subjectively value different goals and different amounts of effort required to reach those goals differently. It's not always 100%. It could be 50%, it could be 60%, it could be 70%. It could be a whole slew of different variables. Expecting this all to fit into neat little boxes of yes or no is very naive. It's just a false dichotomy fallacy. For instance, bad policies one year might lead to incentive reduction below what a normal free market would produce by 90%, and then different bad policies the next year might reduce it by 70% instead. Different sets of fiscal policy can both be bad and destructive to incentives while having different results. Pointing out these different results doesn't prove that disincentivization didn't exist. Because again, it's not a binary. And simply looking at the total outcome of the harvest and making wild assumptions from that is missing the point by miles. This becomes clear if we look at what Applebaum is referring to. She writes, even Maurice Hindus, the American journalist who generally admired the USSR, could see the problem. When therefore a man came into possession of two or three horses, as many are a few more cows, about half a dozen pigs, and when he raised three or four hundred foods of rye or wheat, he fell into the category of kulak. Once a peasant became wealthy and successful, he became an enemy. Farmers who were too efficient or effective immediately became figures of suspicion. Even girls stayed away, Hindus recorded. Nobody wants to marry a rich man nowadays. Now, people obviously are still going to have some incentive to produce grain, because they, at the very least, need some of it to live. They just won't have the incentive to produce at optimal levels, especially not those capable of doing so because they could potentially get in trouble with the Soviet regime. Tauger does not address this reasoning at all. He's just saying, yep, the archives show a bigger harvest in subsequent years, so clearly the policies didn't reduce incentives because humans are apparently robots with an on-off switch for incentivization, and if production one year is more than another, then it must have been switched on because there's nothing in between. Brilliant analysis, my dude. Brilliant. 10 out of 10. And there are other factors at play as well, which also are not binaries. For instance, bad weather can contribute to a reduced harvest without being the primary cause of the famine. So if, say, the government's involvement is reducing incentives by exactly the same amount each year, we'll just say, hypothetically, 80% to keep it simple, and one year has bad weather contributing another minus 15% reduction and another doesn't, you will have a slight higher harvest in one of those years. This differentiation in outcome proves absolutely nothing as to whether or not the policies are destroying incentives, and it certainly doesn't mean
mean the weather is the primary cause if you compare it to what the harvest could have been without unnecessary Soviet interference in place. Tauger just doesn't seem to realize this, looking at it entirely from a black and white perspective. Now, there's a lot of other reasoning errors in this review, mostly all falling into the pedantry problem, but to keep this video concise, I'll skip to the part that counts the most where Tauger finally attempts to refute Applebaum's main conclusion in her epilogue. We'll just read this. Neither crop failure nor bad weather caused the famine in Ukraine. Although the chaos of collectivization helped create the conditions that led to the famine, the high numbers of deaths in Ukraine between 1932 and 1934, and especially the spike in the spring of 1933, were not caused directly by collectivization either. Starvation was the result, rather, of the forcible removal of food from people's homes, the roadblocks that prevented peasants from seeking work or food, the harsh rules of the blacklist imposed on farms and villages, the restrictions on barter and trade, and the vicious propaganda campaign designed to persuade Ukrainians to watch, unmoved as their neighbors died of hunger. Alright, so finally Tauger is going to try and hit at some central points and make some meaningful arguments that aren't awful. Allegedly. So let's take a look at this. Well, the first of these is once again Tauger not understanding that subtle differences in the harvest totals between years does not tell us the effect that Soviet policies were having on that harvest. Also, why is Tauger confused here about what Applebaum is referring to in regards to plans? Looking at the previous paragraph before she cites the harvest percentage difference between the USSR and Ukraine, she's clearly talking about the Soviet central planning operation as a whole. Tauger also points out how Stalin reduced the grain collections in subsequent years, and implies that Applebaum has no response to this. But she did. Nobody who is being serious, who takes the position that the Holodomor was a genocide today, believes that Stalin was trying to kill all the Ukrainians. That's not an argument we're making. Just enough of them to basically beat them into submission and satisfy Stalin over his concerns of Ukrainian nationalism, and desire for independence from his repressive regime. Which, by the way, this was actually very successful. It would make sense that he would occasionally ease up just a bit based on how things were going. The numbers Tauger is citing here do not tell us anything that refutes this in any meaningful way, and it's in fact exactly what we would expect. Then in regards to blacklisting, Tauger points out that only 400 out of 23,270 collective farms are blacklisted, and thus it could not have been a main cause of the famine. Now, this is technically true, but very, very deceptive. It's true that only 400 specifically collective farms were hit by this policy, but of course there were a lot more than just collective farms. There was also entire districts in Ukraine affected by the blacklist, as well as other villages, village councils, individual properties, co-ops, and other farms. According to the University of Minnesota, the actual number of blacklisted villages was closer to one-third, and 37 out of the 392 districts were also blacklisted, so a lot more than Tauger is leading on here. This is particularly weird, because this information is in fact based on Soviet archival data, and Tauger should be aware of this, but he omits it anyways because it would disprove his point. And then he has the gall to nitpick that Applebaum didn't mention that some of the villages did manage to free themselves from the blacklist, <laughs> right after he just made a much, much more substantial omission right here. Then in regards to Ukrainians not being allowed to flee the famine, we get another weird nitpick from Tauger that completely ignores incentives, and just basic human psychology. He implies that locking Ukrainian borders must not have been that big of a deal because only around 219,000 peasants were caught and mostly sent back to their villages. This completely ignores the obvious qualitative factor that many more Ukrainians were struggling, dying, and thus probably wanted to flee, but did not because they did not want to take the risk of crossing a border that they were not allowed to cross and potentially thus making things even worse for themselves. It is completely insane and nonsensical to judge the effects of a law just based on the number of people caught breaking it. Just going by that number of people caught tells you absolutely nothing about the number of people who would want to try and cross the border if the lockdown wasn't put in place. But of course, this is a qualitative factor and thus cannot be measured, and empiricists love to pretend that that means it doesn't exist. But just because you can't empirically measure a factor doesn't mean you can just get to play dumb and ignore it. Tauger is also ignoring the fact that barring Ukrainians from fleeing the famine while allowing other ethnic groups to do so is a massive red flag and smoking gun signaling Stalin's intentions. If the Holodomor wasn't a genocide against Ukrainians, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever for this particular policy to be put in place ever in the first place. You would have to argue that Stalin somehow didn't know that locking Ukrainians into a region while his regime was repeatedly stealing food from them, while they were already starving, would kill them. Which is of course completely ridiculous. Tauger also takes Applebaum out of context here. She never stated herself that beyond Kharkiv, where the Russian territory starts, 
efforts, there was no hunger. Rather, if you actually read her book, she is merely quoting an interview with a Ukrainian worker who believed this to be true. And she isn't exactly hiding this fact, it's very obviously the case that this is just an interview. And it says in her citation that this is an interview. Whether this is a case of Tauger being deceptive, or if he just made a mistake and was only skim reading this part of Red Famine, I'll let you guys be the judge of that. Then in regards to food being stolen from people's homes, Tauger calculates that only 5,500,000 people out of 20 million would have been affected. Now again, the general number cited for those killed in the Holodomor is around 4 million, not 20 million. No one's actually making that statement. Again, nobody is making the argument that Stalin was trying to kill all of Ukrainians. I'm also not sure where he's getting this 100 number from. The hired brigades certainly had enough time to search a lot more than that. So this is likely a lowball estimate, but even if Tauger is accurate, 5,500,000 people killed through having their food stolen from them by the newly hired brigades is still a really large number and by no means a win. This is also another example of pedantry where the pedant will ignore the big picture. And historians who argue that the Holodomor was a genocide, it is well understood that it was more or less death by a thousand cuts rather than one specific big edict. Lots of bad policies combined together is how the four million total came to be. Then in regards to the Soviet propaganda campaigns, Tauger nitpicks one issue that some of the propaganda, specifically the one about some peasants withholding grain, may have been half true. The problem is again that Tauger misunderstood the true reason why those peasants were incentivized to hoard grain in the first place, as I explained earlier, as it was primarily the Soviets' bad policy that caused the problem and created those incentives. This also ignores all the other general Soviet propaganda and agitprop that Applebaum was alluding to in her conclusion, which is well documented and not really disputed by anyone. So once again, Tauger has said something that is only technically true in a way that is irrelevant and misses the point and adds nothing to the conversation yet again, totally failing to disprove any central point here. As for what Talger has to say against Applebaum's view that restrictions on barter and trade contributed to the Holodomor, this one is just kind of funny. Talger writes that Applebaum does not present any evidence for her claim that limits on Kolko's trade were a cause of the famine. Yeah, sure, not being allowed to trade grain surely would certainly have no negative effects on people's ability to gain grain. Another brilliant top mind economic analysis. 10 out of 10. Now, Tauger is technically correct that some provinces were eventually allowed to trade. The problem is this restriction never should have existed, period. You shouldn't need permission to trade food during a famine. That's insane. But let's talk about Soviet aid sent to Ukraine, because this is one point that tankies often try to use, and Applebaum did appear to get slightly wrong. It's true that the Soviets started aid slightly sooner than she claimed. The problem, however, is that the aid given to Ukrainians was utterly meaningless and a very small pittance. The poods of grain given through this so-called aid was only about 12 million, but the amount of grain the Soviets were demanding from Ukraine was 510 million poods. So let's do some basic math and reasoning here. Say your family needs 10 units of food to survive. Your farm produces 100 units. The government comes and steals all 100 units from you. But hey, they generously sent you an aid package and a couple months later with one unit in it. Such heroes, much wow. Aren't you glad for the government? Yeah, that's pretty much what's going on here with the whole but the Soviet regime did send aid to Ukraine argument. Again, technically true, but utterly meaningless once you look at the big picture and overall numbers because overall, it was a massive net loss as evidenced both by the total numbers and of course by the millions of deaths by starvation, which would not have happened if the Soviets actually did care and were actually trying to help Ukraine and send meaningful aid. You don't just get to toss a crumb at someone and say, oh hey, there I sent you some aid. That's what you do when you're pretending to send aid. Aid, which is of course exactly what the Soviets were actually doing. This pittance they were granted comes across as more likely a way for the Soviet regime to try and hide what they were doing by telling the half-truth that, oh yeah, we did try to help Ukraine, we totally sent aid to them, and apparently the propaganda worked since tankies are still relying on this ridiculous spin job to this day. Then finally, Tauger argues that the 3.9 million death toll is still disputable, but cites no good evidence to the contrary. He then goes on to make his most pedantic argument in the entire stack. Tauger claims that Applebaum asserts that Kyiv and Kharkiv had the highest mortality rates without providing any evidence. Okay, listen carefully, because this is just next level redonkulous. It's true, technically, that Applebaum doesn't directly cite evidence for this. Rather, she cites a paper by Serhii Plopki, which then goes on to cite the research in the review Famines in European Economic History, The Last Great European Famines Reconsidered, which does include evidence that those places had the highest mortality. Now, Sure, I guess, Applebaum could have done better and just directly cited this review instead of citing someone else citing it. But that is so utterly pointless to point out. And of course,
course, Tauger is lying by implication here by acting like this means the evidence doesn't exist. Yes, the evidence does exist. Here it is again in case you missed it. You can clearly see them having the highest mortality. And you can tell that Tauger almost certainly knows this because if you read carefully in what he's saying, you notice that he isn't specifically saying this evidence doesn't exist. He's just nitpicking over the fact that Applebaum didn't properly cite it. Who freaking cares? So she cited someone citing the evidence instead of citing the evidence directly. whoop dee freaking do What does pointing that out add to the conversation? Nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. The only thing that matters is whether or not that evidence exists and whether or not what she's saying is true. That's it. That's all that should matter. This is completely insane. Claptrap like this is exactly what's wrong with academia these days, is that you have people like this making intentionally ridiculous arguments. There's no way that Tauger could not know that this doesn't actually disprove what Applebaum is saying. And that's pretty much this so-called debunk of Red Famine, a complete and total joke with nothing but nitpicks and sleight of hands. There's a few other points Tauger attempted to make here, but honestly his failure to refute her central conclusion, coupled with the poor understanding of economics, is enough to render the entire thing just completely worthless. Which is really not too surprising because generally no one cites this review outside of tanky circles. Anyways, with that out of the way, I would like to now go over some of the things Bad Panda said in response to my Hello to More video. Although, to be honest, if you understand why Tauger's review of Red Famine isn't exactly the genius evisceration communists make it out to be, you kinda already understand enough to understand why Bad Panda is wrong. As his entire central point of what he's saying relies on the review I just went over in order for it to even make sense. Which means that technically I could actually get away with not responding to it, but I should anyway just because there's some things that really need to be pointed out here. There is a very big difference between tankies and Tauger. Mark Tauger doesn't really strike me as a tanky. He's just someone who has staked his position on the Soviet famines on a take that hasn't really aged very well as there's more rational examinations now of the evidence in the Soviet archives, which prove that Robert Conquest was in fact mostly correct all along. And so now Tauger has to defend his position by resorting to academic nitpicking at things that don't really matter. Tankies, on the other hand, tend to rely on some arguments that are a little less pedantic and much more closer to just outright lying, gaslighting, and other rhetoric. Although they do rely on pedantry as well. So let's look at a few things here. I'll start with this. He basically just sort of talks really smugly and ignores the vast majority of my video to selectively choose parts of it to respond to, which I'm not going to do to him. I'm going to show his entire video as I respond to it part by part. So yeah, just a bit of courtesy for you, my friend. So there's this really silly rhetoric out there that you need to respond to everything line by line when doing a response, when it's actually better to just directly refute the central argument and watch the Jenga tower fall. In fact, if anything, responding to every single statement or responding to too much of it can, if anything, be a red flag that the take you're about to watch isn't very good. It's very rare that everything a person says is just completely wrong, and even when that is the case, you still don't really need to respond to every little thing that they said in order to prove that they're wrong. So when someone sets out to try and respond to everything, it's usually a pretty good sign that what you're about to listen to is just going to be pedantry. They're going to point to tiny insignificant things about an argument or about a person's statement that don't really matter. And that's a best case scenario. A lot of times they'll just misrepresent the arguments or not understand the arguments in order to pretend like everything they said was false. This can also be somewhat of a form of gish gallop, where they're just trying to waste your time with hours upon hours of content or writing some massive 50 paragraph essay, and then they will pretend like they've won by attrition if you don't respond to every single little thing. And the reality is you really only need to and really only should respond to the things that are wrong and matter. So for instance, if someone just goes on and on for five hours of waffle until they finally get to the point, you don't need to respond to the five hours of waffle. You just need to respond to the point if you're trying to refute it. All Bad Panda is really doing here is just using some rhetoric to make himself appear like he's being more thorough when really he's just being pedantic. Anyway, next up. This is just a general problem you often see with commie logic. If the source is data from a socialist state, then it is to be accepted without question, but if the source comes from a non-socialist state, then it's evil, imperious, Nazi propaganda or something. This is one of the many reasons why talking to communists often feels like you're talking to a wall. I just want to interject here. Which scholars are you talking about exactly who take commie Soviet propaganda at face value? Could you name them? Because you don't seem to actually provide an example for your claim here. Sure, I'll gladly provide an example. Mark Tauger. If you need to understand why, just watch the first 25 minutes of this video. Glad I could clear things up for you there. But in all seriousness, this is an example of tanky gaslighting. Holodomor denial in general is just almost all entirely based on Kremlin talking points. At least when you look under the hood of what someone's actually saying. They may try to hide this by citing various cherry-picked data way out of context, but ultimately it almost always comes down to claiming there's this weird Ukrainian nationalist conspiracy from which the entire Holodomor narrative came from. Anyway, next clip. My video is a counter-argument to the um, Wikipedia article on the Holodomor genocide question as it was at the time when I made it. I understand it's been changed since, I don't really know how. 
but that's what my video is. So, when the Wikipedia article on that subject begins by citing, as if they are some sort of authority, the governments of 14, 15, whatever it was, different countries, who acknowledge the Holodomor as a genocide, well then it makes sense for me to respond to that with a counter-argument explaining why these countries acknowledging the Holodomor as a genocide doesn't actually matter at all for the question of whether or not it was a genocide. Because whether it is a genocide or not is something that is going to be determined for analysis of the facts, not through pointing to the say-so of X or Y government. Okay, now this one's partially an issue. This part I definitely need to respond to because thinking about it, I realized I didn't make the main point of what I was saying entirely clear, which means I actually can't blame Bad Panda that hard for misrepresenting it. My point wasn't so much centered around the two quoque, but rather around the fact that governments usually have reasons, some good, some bad, for why they consider something a genocide or not, and that it's irresponsible to dismiss those reasons for all those governments just using one bad counterexample for Australia. The relationship between the state, the media, and academia is much, much, much more complicated than Bad Panda is letting on here. And in a way, I just kind of made the mistake of assuming that everybody understood what I meant and assuming that everybody knows what the cathedral means and what the regime means and how all that stuff works together. And most people actually don't, which means my argument could have been better put because I was relying on too much external knowledge. My point about the Dukoku is more or less that Bad Pan is just trying to sweep all those reasons under the rug and then not have to actually deal with them. It's a way for him to ignore a lot of the arguments behind why so many first world countries have recognized the Holodomor as a genocide and then act like pointing out enough errors in the Wikipedia article will then magically prove that the Holodomor never happened in the way at least they say that it happened. That's what I really meant. I was more or less criticizing Bad Panda for focusing too much on trying to discredit all the sources, aka source midwittery, rather than actually giving good reasons for why the Holodomor never happened, which of course he admittedly can't give because there aren't really any good reasons. Anyways, moving on. Elman, however, does believe that there is evidence that the Soviet leadership considered some of the famine's victims to have deserved their fate. However now, I just want to like address this epic meme that he puts on the screen here that also just so happens to blot out the source. Can you please explain what the fuck you... this is even about? Where did I say that it never happened for one? Because clearly the famine happened and millions of people died. And where did I say they deserved it for two? And how is this relevant to what's actually being said? Because what I'm doing here is merely summarizing um, what Michael Elman, who actually does, by the way, think that the Holodomor was a genocide, said on the topic. So... What in the f is this about? Do you just like have a meme folder and you can't help yourself from using them like as much as possible? Even in even in cases where it makes no sense whatsoever. This is absolutely baffling. Like what I'm saying at this point of the video isn't even my own opinion. It's not even my own argument. I'm summarizing the argument of a scholar on the topic. Okay, yes, in fact, guilty as charged. I have a meme folder and I like to randomly put memes in my videos for comedic purposes. Guilty as charged. I also use various open source software to regularly make my own memes. Again, guilty as charged. I am not sorry. Okay, seriously though, there is this really weird thing I've seen a few people do that I have seen in some responses to videos where they will respond to the meme and make inferences about my argument from the meme that I didn't actually intend. Now, I was of course using the two doges meme to make fun of the Soviet leaders who made the statement that implied the Ukrainians deserved it. Not the scholar Michael Elliman who was citing it, which is the scholar that Bad Panda was talking about, of course. I'm actually kind of baffled how he didn't realize this. My point with that meme was to show the twisted and contradictory nature of tankies who deny the Holodomor was an intentional genocide, despite the fact that Soviets at the time thinking Ukrainians may have deserved it is proof of intent. It's pretty freaking simple, to be honest. Anyways, next clip. Okay. The actual issue with Elman's argument here, and the affirmative for the Holodomor genocide question in general, is there is no proof of specific intent regarding the targeting specifically of Ukrainians. That is to say, measures were taken against peasants for being peasants, whether they were Russian, Kazakh, Ukrainian, or any other nationality. Okay, now this is just pure gaslighting, but luckily it means I can finally get into something a bit more juicy. So I'll answer this question for him. Now, first off, again, to some degree, this is already refuted by the first part of my video. But in case you missed it, I'll just give you all a quick summary of the evidence that Ukrainians were targeted during the Holodomor. First off is the fact that Ukrainians specifically were banned from fleeing the famine and their borders were locked down while other ethnic groups were allowed to do so. Second of all is the multiple letters which showed that Stalin was completely paranoid about a Ukrainian peasant nationalist upgrade 
uprising, specifically in Ukraine. Not just peasants, Ukraine itself was mentioned, giving him an obvious motive. Third was the 1100 graders who Stalin set up for the specific purpose of stealing food from Ukrainians, as they were starving to death. Fourth was the disproportionate amount of excessive deaths in major Ukrainian cities. And fifth was the generally disproportionate excess deaths of Ukrainians overall compared to the rest of Russia. Which, by the way, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. If the entire point of collective farms is to share the grains equally, why would Ukrainians have over seven times greater of a death rate than everywhere else in Russia? Well, it's almost as if the communist rhetoric and lies for equality are a mask for something else. Whoever would have guessed. And six is the fact that arguments for natural causes in Ukraine for the famine in that region have been proven to be nonsensical. Seventh is the fact that letters in the Soviet archives proves that Stalin knew that Ukraine Ukrainians were dying and thus knew that his policies were killing them, unless of course you want to try and argue that you can't prove that Stalin knew that locking down Ukrainian borders and stealing food from them while they were starving to death was killing them. I can go on, but I think I've made my point. So anyway, next clip. This is rather just a citation of one academic's opinion on the matter. So he said here that Stalin had a motive due to wanting to suppress anti-Soviet demonstrations and the Ukrainian national identity. Yet his source here is one scholar from 1983 simply stating that Stalin had planned it carefully and that it was intended from the start to subdue and Sovietize Ukraine. All of this is simple statements that are backed up by no evidence. It's this author, Warope, says this, therefore it's true. If you actually have specific evidence that Stalin intentionally caused the famine to attack anti-Soviet demonstrations and Ukrainian national identity, I would hope that you could provide it because it's something that has eluded scholars up until this point. So this is one of the things I meant when I accused him of source midwittery. A common rhetorical trick tankies will pull when they are denying historical events in regards to Soviet Russia and the crimes that they committed is that they will demand primary evidence for it and then disallow you from using any historian who doesn't agree with what the tanky is saying. The reason this is deceptive is because historians generally mine hundreds of thousands of documents from hundreds of archives and compile them together into a cohesive statement. So by asking you to do this for them, the tanky is asking you to effectively reinvent the wheel and redo do all the heavy lifting, demanding that you redo the work the scholar already did. The reason they ask this is, of course, because they know that doing this can take months, possibly even years of grueling time, while on the flip side for them, there's no effort whatsoever. It only takes them less than a minute or so to demand you reinvent the wheel for them. So it's basically a form of gish gallop. It's designed to waste your time while making them appear correct because you can't immediately always give you the evidence in the way that they're asking for it. It's one of those things that sounds like convincing rhetoric until you understand the trick behind it. Oh, and by the way, it's effectively the same rhetoric in regards to the Holodomor, when they say that the Holodomor being a genocide has been debunked by the opening of the Soviet archives, and then they don't actually specify exactly what they're talking about. Because, of course, that's also nonsense. Anyways, next clip. Okay. This part of the video is citing a book by Anne Applebaum, who is a journalist for one, not a historian. And it is, again, making a pretty empty statement. In 1933, the cities knew the villages were dying, the leaders and administrators of the Communist Party and the government knew the villages were dying. Okay, so this is just a flat-out lie, and a really silly one. Anne Applebaum is considered both a journalist and a historian, because as it turns out, you can be more than one thing and study more than one thing. Imagine that. In fact, even Mark Tauger recognizes this in the very first paragraph of his review, that she's a historian. So here Bad Panda is actually being contradicted by his own source. So unless he just didn't read his own source here, in which if that's the case, wow, this is really way below my level, then that means Bad Panda is just lying, which unfortunately is probably what's going on here. To be honest, this entire statement from him is another one of those things refuted by the first half of this video, but I'm responding to it anyways because I need to put emphasis on just how comfortable tankies are with lying. And the saddest part is, even if he wasn't lying, it would still just amount to being a mug credentials argument. Even if Bad Panda was telling the truth on this, and Anne Applebaum hadn't studied history at Yale, would that really change the validity of her arguments? Not really. So this is a really, really weird lie. I mean, imagine if I use this same reasoning in the first half of my video to say that Mark Tauger is not a historian, but is in fact a musician, because hey, he also studied music. That's pretty much the type of dishonesty we're dealing with here, where we were saying that Anne Applebaum is just a journalist and not a historian because she's done some journalist work. Overall, pretty ridiculous, so I'll just move on to the next clip. This year that they were ripping food at gunpoint, from people who were clearly starving but this citation on the screen doesn't actually say that that's two citations that he's made in a row here that simply do not actually say what he says they do they do not even remotely come close to backing up the claim that he's making 
So this is Bad Panda just completely misrepresenting the type of video I make. My videos are meant to be as concise and compressed as possible, with sources to dig through included in the description below for people interested in again digging further. Oftentimes what I will do to keep my videos concise is I will include something on screen that is in addition to what I am saying. So for instance, my point in the tidbit Bad Panda is calling out there was that they were stealing food from starving people, and the source I put on screen was to prove that in addition to that, the Soviet leaders knew what they were doing. It's not that I'm just putting random random sources and random data on the screen. I'm just trying to explain my point as in little time as possible. And Bad Panda calling this out and complaining about it is really just another example of pedantry and missing the point. So let's move on to the next clip. They are effectively saying, you can't prove that Stalin knew that locking down and stealing food from starving Ukrainians would kill them. Therefore, it wasn't a genocide. This legitimately is the reasoning that is being used. I wish I was joking. Wait, how is that the reasoning that's being used? Who used that reasoning exactly? Because Michael Elman, who I was summarizing in the part before this that he was supposedly responding to here, didn't use that reasoning, nor was I even citing him in agreement with him, because he actually agrees with you. He thinks the Holodomor was a genocide. Are you a bit lost? Did you get a bit confused? So for some really weird reason, Bad Panda seems to think I'm still focused on Michael Elman statements here at this part of my video, when actually it already moved on. I was actually just giving a general big picture of the logical conclusions of what the tankies I am going over in my entire video, not just the section on Bad Panda, but actually all the other sections in my video that he didn't respond to. When you deny that the Holodomor was a genocide, despite the evidence of Ukrainians being targeted, you basically have to use the reasoning at some point that Stalin could not have known that locking down and stealing food from starving people would kill them. That's my point. Not not understanding the logical conclusions of your own beliefs does not make you exempt from the consequences. Anyways, most of the rest of Bad Panda's response to me is really just things that I have already refuted when I went over Mark Tauger's work and Mark Tauger's review of Ann Applebaum. So a lot of it is just Bad Panda repeating Mark Tauger's bad arguments. So I'm not really going to respond to that because I just don't really feel like repeating myself. For instance, he repeats the same bad argument that Mark Tauger used about the blacklisting, which completely ignores the fact that more than just collective farms were being blacklisted. If you want to know why all that fluff is wrong, again, just to watch the first part of this video. Mad Panda also lies about Robert Conquest recounting all of his arguments. Conquest changed some of his arguments when new evidence came out, however, he didn't really change it meaningfully in the direction that tankies are implying that he changed it. Conquest still believed that Stalin did a contentional genocide, he just didn't like using the word genocide because of all the drama surrounding the definition. So Conquest just avoided the term to avoid the problem. And really, just a basic Google search of Robert Conquest and his life's work will reveal this to you. Tankies love to say that he recanted his arguments, but they don't exactly explain what exactly he took back. Never actually go into the specifics regarding that because, of course, they're just lying. Again, tankies are very, very, very comfortable with lying. Now, again, while Bad Panda's central point is pretty much refuted by my refutation of Mark Tauger's review, as a bonus, there's one last thing I want to go over. Even though it doesn't have anything to do with the Holodomor at all, I want to go over this as just as a final thing, a nice little bonus for this video, because it's an extremely silly and immature argument I see a lot of political pundits and a lot of political streamers and other political or philosophical YouTube channels doing, and it's a really silly thing to say. So here it is. And buddy, if you think the New York Times is left wing, I don't even know what to say to you. You've got, you've got some problems going on there in the brain of yours. So yeah, there's this really weird thing people will do where they will say a source is right wing when it isn't, or left wing when it isn't, by placing themselves at the center. This is the same awful reasoning that Second Thought used when he tried to say the Atlantic was a right wing source, simply because it is right wing in relation to him. This is, of course, completely absurd. You can't just treat your own political and philosophical views as the center of the universe. If we all did that, then right and left would very quickly dissolve and lose all meaning to it. For example, me. I'm a far-right libertarian myself. I'm not exactly hiding it, it's in my bio. So I could technically use this exact same silly reasoning to say that a publication like the New York Post is actually far left, or that even Newsmax leans left. But of course I'm not going to do that because I'm not a centrist, and placing yourself as the center by which to judge everything makes absolutely no sense unless you yourself actually are a centrist. So the correct way to see if a publication leans left or leans right is to look at it in relation to everything else. And I honestly find it really bizarre just how many content creators don't seem to understand this. But anyways, getting back on topic, because again, that doesn't have anything to do with the Lodomore. My conclusion here is that there's a very good reason why the general academic consensus is against Mark Tauger. And no, it's not because there is some far-right conspiracy in various first world countries to make communism look bad. It's because Tauger's reasoning is terrible and based entirely around nitpicks and misrepresenting data. And any communist who cites him doing this is therefore wrong for the same reasons that he is wrong.
Anyways, that's all for now. That was a pretty long one, but if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, leave a comment for the algorithm, tip my ko-fi or whatever. Till next time.